Hello everyone and welcome to Commsverse. The session is called Emergency Calling, The Life You Might Save Might Just Be Your Own. And our presenter today is Andy Carrigal. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you everybody for uh, coming. Uh, I can't see you. If you have some uh, questions, uh, if there's any uh, Q&A, uh, please feel free to use a little uh, question box. Um, uh, and then uh, afterwards, uh, we'll go ahead and try to get as many of those answered as possible. Uh, and if you stay tuned to the very end, we do have the breakout session uh, on the slide. It should also be, uh, you might also have that in an invite or uh, uh, somewhere else. But I'm going to go ahead and uh, get started. Uh, just a huge uh, slide of sponsors. And, and uh, we really, really, really appreciate uh, everybody on this page here. Um, they uh, they came together, uh, they helped put this thing together, um, and uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, just great people uh, that work for all these different companies. So uh, just take a minute, uh, reach out to them, support them, chat with them uh, in, in the, their individual teams rooms or uh, even in the virtual uh, reality sessions. A uh, little bit about me. Uh, I am a Microsoft uh, Teams MVP, uh, currently really an Office Apps and Services MVP, but I specialize in Teams. Uh, before that, I was kind of a, a Skype MVP. Before that, I was a Link MVP. Um, but really, I'm just a, a voice guy, so uh, specifically uh, Microsoft Voice. So really, since you know the, the live communication servers, uh, Office communication servers days, uh, when they started building in uh, SIP connectivity and voice, that's that's really when I fell in love with the thing. Before that, I was kind of an exchange guy. Um, I'm the UC consulting lead for a uh, US-based consultancy uh, called BDO Digital. Uh, I'm personally based out of Chicago. I don't travel a whole lot. I don't go a lot of places. Uh, and my office is uh, based right here in Chicago and as well. Um, I'm a tool writer. I like to write a bunch of different PowerShell utilities. So, um, if you're ever interested in that, I've got some some fun little things, some fun little GUI tools that uh, for like ethical walls and uh, information barriers and things like that, that uh, really anything that can be a little bit difficult to surface uh, through PowerShell or is a little bit annoying to surface through PowerShell. Uh, we like to uh, I like to build GUI wrappers around that just to make uh, people's lives easier. Little little things like uh, teams lockdown GUIs, like if you needed to lock down teams to uh, just the ability for certain people to create it. You don't have to dig through all the old power shell commands. You can just run the script, up pops the form. Uh, and I'm also hanging around on Twitter a whole lot. Uh, see Anthony Carrigal. Uh, so uh, go ahead and ping me. Uh, you can ping me there if you have any questions. You can ping me afterwards with questions as well. If you're watching this uh, recorded, uh, you can always just uh, ping me on uh, Twitter. You can ping me uh, here in the uh, comms versus teams, uh, however you want to ping me. Uh, you can reach out, but uh, a good way to contact me even uh, uh, later in the uh, game is is always through Twitter. So what are we talking about today? Uh, really, we're just talking about how are we going to get a hold of uh, police, fire, ambulance, any emergency services. Uh, that's built into to Teams, but there's uh, different ways of accessing that and uh, different rules and regulations. So I kind of wanted to take a minute and step through all of that uh, and and really just uh, explain the why, the how, uh, and the whatnots. So why bother? Uh, I've, so I am US based. I mentioned I'm here in Chicagoland and I see a lot of deployments, not specifically Teams, but even old phone systems, Avias, Mitel, Cisco's, uh, where they're just not compliant as far as the law is concerned. And, and uh, we'll get into it in a little bit, but American laws can be a bit complex. Uh, and they say, you know what? Uh, why we don't really care about that though. I mean, if somebody calls 911 and the address isn't right, it's just like a it's just like a fifty dollar fine over here. So we don't really care. So that that's kind of the the why bother question. And I kept hearing that a lot, and it would always irked me a bit. Uh, so there is a legal compliance issue. Clearly, uh, you you don't want to be compliant legally there uh, because you know you you don't want to have to deal with those fines if you don't. Um, but there's also lawsuits. We had a, I had a manufacturing client where basically they had these enormous warehouses, just absolutely enormous warehouses. Uh, but if somebody had a box fall on them or something, there's there's no real way to know where they are in that warehouse. 
uh, when we stepped in, we were replacing an Avaya system. And they can turn right around and sue you, sue you for that. And uh, it'd be very hard to defend yourself if you didn't do any kind of effort uh, to help locate them. Uh, and really just because lives matter, compassion, you know, you, if somebody gets hurt, you want to try to help them. You want to, you don't want to be a jerk about it. You, you want to try to uh, reach out to them as quickly as possible, know where they are uh, and try to uh, try to get them the assistance they need uh, as quickly as possible. So where does this apply? Um, really just about everywhere. Uh, there's a lot of different countries that have some specialized emergency numbers. Uh, I think the different countries have different laws and numbers to dial. A lot of them, uh, the majority of countries around the world seem to be uh, fairly simplistic where uh, a static phone number uh, to a location, we kind of want a street address, uh, or we just want to at least get you, maybe even not even that, we just want to get you to the right uh the right emergency dispatch uh so when you call the number you're not you're not routed to some other city somewhere else in your your country uh but america is typically the most complex here so uh we have a, a a lot of different rules around we have to be able to dynamically locate you which uh gets harder and harder uh, the more mobile the solution uh and as we all know teams is a very very mobile solution So as I mentioned, many countries, uh, they do require a static location per phone number. Um, but American Americans have, uh, if you're deploying something internationally uh, and it does uh, reach into America uh, or it's based in America, uh, you have to be aware of a whole slew of federal laws and varying state laws. Now, you don't have to have them memorized. There's a many, many great resources that you can look them up on the internet as you need them. Uh, but the point is to to note that it's not just American laws. There's different state laws. So uh, some states have no requirements, uh, really no requirements at all. Uh, there's not there's not much of a law other than you know when you call uh, you might call 911, uh, our American emergency number. They just want you to get you some plate to the local police. Um, but there's others that have uh, the need to locate within 40,000 square feet or even smaller than that. We do have our federal laws uh, came into effect earlier this year is a law called Kerry's law. So if you're uh, not familiar, uh, in about 2013, uh, Hank Hunt's daughter Kerry uh, basically was uh, attacked and killed um, by her estranged husband in a uh, Texas hotel room. Uh, and while she was there, her nine-year-old daughter was trying to call 911 on the phone to, to try to get the police to show up. She was just dialing it again and again, and it just wasn't getting through. Uh, and the reason was because the hotel wanted uh, their phone system required you to dial a nine before you dialed 911. You always had to dial a nine to get any outside line. But of course, this kid didn't know that. Um, and it was just just a tragedy. So they uh, we've enacted this federal law that basically says uh, any any new phone system, at least um, if you have an existing phone system, I, I don't believe you're required to rush out and fix this, although you should. Uh, but any new phone system deployment, um, you can't require a prefix or a digit to be dialed before dialing uh, 911. Now, uh, if you're coming from a system like uh, like an old Cisco or a Vice system and they used to dial eight and then dial 911 to get out or they dialed nine and then 911 to get out, uh, I, I'll set those up so that they still work. Um, but you have to make sure 911 on its own uh, can reach emergency services in the US. Um, but in a panic, if somebody if somebody says dialing eight 911 because that's what they were used to for years, uh, you want to have that programmed in as well. Uh, another aspect of this law is that there needs to be designated personnel, uh, typically a local employee, uh, maybe um, emergency response team or might just be reception in a small office. Um, if you're small enough, it might just be the IT guy, uh, but somebody has to be notified that a 911 call has been placed um, just so that they can provide assistance uh, or, or, uh, or, or whatever help that they possibly can. Uh, but the notification is is a little bit vague. It's uh, it can be a call, an email, chat, text, pop up message. Uh, really, the point is that it, it needs to be uh, some sort of instant notification. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, how Teams handles that in a upcoming slide. We also have uh, Ray Bombs Act that's uh, coming in. So Ray Bomb Act is named for the late Ray Bomb, uh, who's a former vice president of government affairs at the National Association of Broadcasters. But uh, the reason you always see it capitalized 
uh, is because they also made an acronym for repacked airway repack airwaves yielding better access for users of modern services. Uh, so I guess I should have capitalized that last S too. Um, but basically, uh, this has not yet gone into effect, and and I think there's still some uh, clarifications being made around it. But basically, uh, nationally in the U.S., any wired or fixed telephony devices, uh, effectively a desk phone that's sitting on a desk and wired into the wall, uh, we're going to have to uh, provide a dispatchable location. Uh, so we want to get them right to the street address and some more granular information like uh, office suite number or a floor or room number, something like that. Uh, but it's not really well defined how granular we have to locate them. Uh, in 2022, we're going to have to be able to uh, locate uh, wireless devices as well. So that might be uh, a Teams user using a laptop uh, or a uh, uh, maybe uh, the Teams uh, client on their mobile device or, or something of that nature. Just a sampling of some U.S. state laws as well. Uh, in Illinois, where I am, we have to uh, locate to the street address and within 40,000 square feet uh, or about 3,700 square meters. So uh, if you want to do the math, those warehouses I was talking about with the uh, boxes and the uh, the uh, client that's just kind of shrugging, those are 900,000 square feet. So uh, much, much larger than 40,000 square feet. Uh, so breaking those out was a little bit rough, but we did get it done. Uh, Massachusetts is even smaller, uh, 22, a uh, little uh, over 22,000 square feet, I believe, or about 2,000 square meters. Uh, and Michigan, if I understand, is 7,000 square feet, which is, or 650 square meters, which is uh, uh, actually very uh, tight, uh, kind of a tight space to, to be able to locate people. But like I said, there's uh, there are other states that really don't have much in the way of laws at all, and Wisconsin's one of those. Um, there's no real regulations. Uh, now, that said, uh, every client I've ever had in Wisconsin, because they have the ability to do that, this uh, with Skype for Business or formerly Link or now Teams, they've had the ability to kind of dynamically locate people. Uh, they've always opted to it because, again, it's, it's just a good idea. So a lot of countries have uh, domestic calling plans uh, available to them. Uh, not every country, of course, but a lot of countries do. So uh, if you're uh, in in the US, uh, if you have a static address assigned uh, and you're just using a calling plan uh, and you have no other dynamic stuff uh, uh, entered in your system, the default is basically uh, the call is going to be intercepted uh, by a uh, 911 operator to validate the address before patch sing it on to your, uh, your local emergency dispatch. They just want to validate it because uh, uh, for example, today, uh, my office is in Oak Brook, but I live in Plainfield. Uh, and if I were to dial 911 from Teams, it's just not going to get to the right place. So uh, they will interrupt that call and, and validate that it's coming uh, from the location they expect. Now, if we do configure our di matching dynamic locations uh, where we can identify where you are based on networking information, uh, we can make sure that it's delivered directly to the correct dispatch with no intercept. So. Uh, if I'm uh, in my Oak Brook office and I dial 911, it doesn't get intercepted. It goes right to uh, the Oak Brook police. But if I'm at the Chicago office and I dial 911, it goes right to the Chicago police force. Uh, outside of the US, uh, we deliver the calls with a whatever the static location is specified. We don't have that uh, 911 or emergency calling uh, intercept uh, that they do have in the US. It's a slightly different behavior. With direct routing, uh, which I'm becoming more and more of a common configuration these days, I, a lot of people are opting to do direct routing. And that, of course, uh, if you're not familiar, but I'm if you're here, I'm assuming you are, is basically bringing your own uh, your own uh, carrier, your own uh, telephony trunk into Teams rather than paying Microsoft to to host calling for you. Uh, so if you uh, have dynamic emergency calling configured uh, with this, then calls are uh, routed to the emergency. Uh, call routing policy that's matching the location that you've specified. Uh, and in that location, if you've specified an ELAN number, which is an emergency location identification number, uh, basically a, a phone number, uh, then the local gateway must act on the information. And uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about ELAN on the next slide and, and what I'm talking about more there. Uh, but if nothing's configured, you don't have any kind of emergency call routing policies, it's just going to be sent out the default trunk. 
uh, and go out your SBC to be uh, delivered. So uh, we'll be uh, counting on your SBC to uh, deliver in that fashion. I wanted to talk a little bit about how do we get okay so we're using direct routing and we we're making our emergency call and our network locations are all configured within microsoft teams so we know exactly where the caller needing emergency services is calling from uh, but how do we get that uh, back to our our session border controllers our i or our ip gateways or uh, whatever you may have um, and there's there's typically a, a couple of methodologies um, the first is uh, PID FLO, and that's the presence information data format location object. Basically what that is, is uh, when you send that uh, SIP invite uh, with the VoIP packet, there's some XML buried with it uh, that uh, has all that location information that you programmed into Teams, the validated street addresses and all that. Uh, all that location information is sent uh, with XML out with the, uh, with the uh, SIP packet. Uh, and if you happen to have a telephony provider who, that understands all that stuff, uh then great you're you're all set you don't have to do anything more uh they will make sure that you get to the right dispatch and the correct location is sent um i typically don't see uh, a lot of companies or tele telephony providers uh, supporting that that kind of that next generation 911 here in the us um so we we tend to uh or, or the ones that do are are very very costly um, so we typically fall to the the ELIN methodology. So the ELIN, as I mentioned, the emergency location identification numbers. Basically, the way that works is uh, for each location, we we assign a a phone number that's really not in use uh, in any other way, other than uh, we're using that to designate an uh, emergency location. Uh, so when you make this uh, when you make this uh, this call. Well, and then uh, let me take a step back. So we uh, we then we take all these phone numbers that are assigned to locations and we want to talk to our telephony providers and we want to say, OK, uh, if you see a uh, this phone number calling for emergency services, that's one, two, three fake street. But if you see that number, uh, that's in an entirely different city. So we want to send that somewhere else. So now that the uh, uh, the the our telephony providers uh, program that all in, uh, and they will route the the calls uh, based on this this uh, calling phone number. Uh, so what we can then do is uh, we can get ourselves an ELIN gateway, uh, which would be uh, basically uh, you could have that in built into an audio codes device uh, with an additional license, uh, a ribbon SVC. Uh, also has it available in any node, I believe is um, I don't. Think this is NDA. Uh, the any node is, uh, I believe, already has it in production in uh, in a place, but it's not yet available to the public, so they're working on it. But basically, what happens is, uh, team sends a call through with the PID flow information, uh, the location, and and one of the uh, one of the things in XML is the e ELIN number. Uh, the ELIN gateway sees that uh, ELIN number and it will perform a call mask. So uh, for example, the way audio codes works uh, is they will they'll see the phone number you're calling from, they'll change your caller ID, uh, effectively swap it out for the caller ID matching that location, and they'll send you out. Now your telco knows to route you to the correct uh, emergency location based on that. Uh, when the emergency dispatch open uh, answers the phone, uh, they should hopefully, if they're uh, equipped for it, they'll be able to see all of your uh, the correct location information right down to the room number, depending on how granular you got. Uh, and should that call drop uh, and the emergency has to uh, hit redial or call back, um, the gateway is aware of the last person to make an emergency call from that, uh, that specific location using that ELIN. So it will route it right back to the person who placed the, the emergency call. Uh, so it kind of keeps a, a session table, if you will. Uh, so the ELIN gateway is the more typical uh, setup I see with uh, setting up these uh, emergency, uh, 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 setting up this dynamic emergency location stuff. So how do we actually get all this set up in Microsoft Teams? And do we want to use Admin Center or PowerShell? Uh, and, and realistically, we want to use both. Um, to be honest, small changes, the Admin Center is going to be a 
billion times easier, especially for uh, programming locations, and I'll talk about that in a bit. However, if you've got larger bulk changes, uh, PowerShell is always better. I just uh, uh, we're moving a, a larger client to the cloud right now, and I I basically had to dump all of their there's just too many wi wireless access points that we have to program in and subnets and all kinds of location information, uh, just tons of locations and typing all that would be a, a nightmare. Uh, so we were able to export it all out of the Teams or Skype PowerShell and then re-import it using a Teams PowerShell. The commands are a little bit different, but they're similar enough that it's not uh, a huge effort. So for the most part, uh, anything large or bulk, you're gonna wanna go ahead and use PowerShell. I uh, used to have to use PowerShell a lot more, but I think at this point it's 100% of everything is surfaced in the uh, admin center. Uh, Elin, the Elin number wasn't in there for a while, but it is now. Um, so there's no reason not to use the admin center if you're just adding, uh, you know, an extra location or two. Uh, the PowerShell module uh, does require the Skype for Business Online PowerShell module. It's not in the Teams PowerShell module, but that's for now. They're uh, clearly those will be combined at some point. So our, for our locations, um, we'll go to our, uh, in our Teams Admin Center, we can go to the emergency addresses uh, area and we'll click add and, and add it in. And the reason, then we can fill out a simple form. Uh, and the reason that's so much better than the PowerShell with the new CS online location is if you can see the, the PowerShell command there, besides the fact that it's an unwieldy uh, PowerShell command, you'll see the latitude and the longitude in there. The latitude and longitude are required. Uh, now you can run the PowerShell without it, and you can even get the address validated without it, but it doesn't always surface itself in the admin, uh, the admin center if you don't add the latitude and longitude manually. Uh, getting those, you can get them from, uh, you know, Bing Maps or Google Maps or, or whatever you've got. Uh, but you have to get them in. Otherwise, if you're trying to assign that to a location later, the, uh, or sorry, if you're just trying to assign a, a network uh, segment to that location later, it might not show up in the drop-down list. Uh, if you go just go in there and click Add and you start typing it in, uh, you'll see in the Admin Center it will automatically add that latitude and longitude for you. It'll do all that lookup for you. So it's just way easier to add locations through the Admin Center. Uh, they do all need to be validated, the civic address and locations to be validated. Um, the, oh, I said uh, if we're direct routing with ELIN, we need to specify that with PowerShell, but that's no longer true. Um, but basically, there, there's a couple ways of doing this. There's, uh, we can create a civic address, and uh, we can create a, a civic address, which is just basically the street address, and then add multiple locations to that street address. So if you see the PowerShell down there, you'll see, uh, or I say office 1402 10th floor, new CS online location. That way I can say, okay, this is the 11th floor, the 12th floor, the 13th floor, the 14th floor for the same address. Uh, I don't need to have, um, I don't have to keep retyping in that address again and again and again. I can just keep adding locations to the same address. Now, uh, there is a command, the new CS online uh, civic address uh, to create those addresses, but if you just run new CS online LIS location, it will create the civic address for you and the default location. So we've set up uh, we've set up our emergency locations, and at that point, if we we're using calling plans, we could uh, just you know anybody who did have a calling plan, we can go ahead and assign those locations to those users. Um, but now we want to go ahead and assign uh, some of those. Uh, we want to be, start building out our networking and describing how our company works networking wise so that we can set up the uh, different emergency locations uh, and map them to the individual. Uh, the or sorry, the uh, the network locations to the actual physical locations, the street addresses, if you will. Uh, so we've got uh, four commands available to us. The uh, set CS online LIS subnet, set CS online LIS switch, ports and wireless access points. And at this point in time, uh, the switch and the port uh, commands uh, are there, but they don't exactly, I don't think the uh, client is that granular just yet, if I, if I recall. So we wanna focus on, on the subnets and the wireless access points. Um, typically the way I see this done is uh, what we'll do is we'll break out all of our locations and the easiest thing you can possibly do uh, for the wired stuff uh, is to say okay one subnet per emergency location. Uh, so we don't have one big uh, 
one big bridge subnet across multiple locations uh, or even across multiple buildings. We, we break those down into smaller subnets uh, and do it per emergency location. And then, of course, a wireless access points uh, is not per SSID. Uh, it's not it's not per, per the uh, wireless network, uh, but rather for the individual BSSID, uh, which is each individual access point has its own unique identifier, if you will. So we can locate you right down to the access point that your device connected to. I typically don't want people to get too much more granular than that. Some people say, hey, we want to go right down to the individual port, the individual room. We want to know if we're calling from room 103 or 104, and I typically don't recommend that, although it is possible. Uh, not yet with Teams, but it was with Skype, and it will be with Teams, uh, just because that becomes a, a, a networking nightmare. So if you have a uh, situation where somebody goes in there and they're, somebody's having trouble connecting and a junior network admin goes in and he pulls out that cable out of that port and plugs it into a different port to check it, uh, you might have just changed your 911 location. So anytime somebody touches a Cat5 cable, uh, you have to have a whole lot of process and forms and mess built around that to update uh, your, your phone system. So I typically like to just leave it to the subnet level uh, just to make everybody's life easier. Uh, and that will typically satisfy uh, the laws unless your, your particular laws that you're trying to abide to has a very, very small area configured. Now, what if your 192.1, what if your subnet is 192.168.0.0 or something, and that's on every home Wi-Fi everywhere? Uh, how do you how do you know that somebody's not calling from home? How do you know that they're calling from the office? Uh, and that's where the CS tenant trusted IP address comes in. So basically, what you want to do is you want to take all of the. Uh, we need to know that you're actually calling from physical premises belonging to the organization. So we take all the public IPs that the physical organization has, uh, basically anything that outbound traffic may be natted to, uh, and we can program those into our tenant. So we basically say, all right, tenant, uh, if there's a 911 call being made from Teams and it's from one of these IP addresses, then we know that somebody must be physically in one of the offices, uh, or they should be physically in the offices. Uh, so therefore, we are then going to look at their subnet uh, and then route the 911 call based on that. Uh, that can, you know, you might have to be a little bit careful if you are uh, requiring your users to use a VPN uh, and then all their traffic is routed through, even internet traffic is routed through the VPN, which is not recommended uh, going to Teams. Uh, you might have to be a little careful about that. But that's basically how we can identify, okay, that's, that's, uh, these aren't people's home addresses. These are, uh, these are legitimate office addresses. Uh, Building in the subnets and the Wi-Fi access points, of course, you can do this through the uh, admin center. It is easier to do it here, um, but it's really not that tough to do it from the uh, from PowerShell as well. So uh, if you've got a lot of them uh, or you keep a spreadsheet uh, that maybe you can uh, work off of and refresh, uh, having a little PowerShell script is definitely not a bad idea in this case. So we've built out our, uh, maybe we've built out all of our, our subnets and our Wi-Fi access points, but we still need to uh, build out our network topology. Uh, and uh, this is gonna require us to type in the subnets all over again, so uh, good times. Uh, basically what we can do is we take, a, a, a kind of build a hierarchy. So we have our regions and that a region may be uh, the US region and the uh, APAC region, or maybe the probably break it down further by country, but maybe this is a the US region, our uh, India region, and our UK region. And then there we may have our different cities as listed as sites uh, or different locations if we uh, wanted to break it down into uh, different offices, different floors. And each one of those can have their individualized uh, subnets underneath it. So we want to kind of model that out. Uh, in our network topology and and uh, the admin center makes that real easy to just kind of put together. Uh, as you can see here, I uh, in the picture I have the network region is the Illinois region, uh, but I've got multiple cities listed under the site. And if I were to dig in further, each one of those sites would have multiple subnets uh, underneath it. And you can also see in this picture where I could uh, enter in the trusted IPs I was discussing on an earlier tab. Uh, so again, the subnets as we add them, these are different than the subnets that we added uh, previously for the uh, um, where we would uh, have all of our uh, PIDF flow information uh, that where we'd assign it to a location, that subnet to an individual location. Um, 
these are are different and they they kind of uh, correspond with individual sites. Uh, from there, uh, we can set up our emergency call routing. So uh, if you're using calling plans, it's all just done automatically. You don't need to worry about this. If you're using uh, direct routing, you'll want to make sure that you have your emergency dial mask in here, your emergency dial string. So in the picture, I've got 911 and 9911, both of them. Uh, and then we're, of course, sending that to the online PSTN usage, the Chicago Session Border Controller. So we've kind of created that new emergency number. And then we can create our uh, call routing policy that we basically say, OK, all US branches uh, in our tenants dialing those emergency numbers, uh, we can uh, we can send out through that route so we know where to send the, the calls that are using this emergency call routing policy. And of course, we can do everything again in the admin center. We also have our emergency calling policies. Now that was uh, not to be confused with the emergency call routing policy, which is where are we going to send this call when we receive it and what's the phone number that identifies it as an emergency call. Uh, but the emergency calling policies are more based on uh, notifications. So this is uh, one way of satisfying carrier's law. Uh, and the previous slide also the the making sure that you can dial uh, 911 in the US would also satisfy the US uh, based uh, carrier's law. Um, but in this, what we can do is we can set up a notifications mode. So if we were to set up a notifications mode uh, and we wanted to set it to uh, a notification mode, we would set it to notification only. Uh, basically, um, when we create that, uh, we can specify a group or individual users and say, all right, if somebody makes a 911 call, uh, the experience is a group chat will happen. So they pick up a phone, maybe it's a desk phone, uh, maybe it's their team's client, they dial 911 in the US uh, or anywhere in the world, they're dialing their local emergency number. The uh, a group chat is created and it just says, OK, this caller at this location with all the dynamic information we've uh, uh, programmed in just made an emergency call. Uh, and everybody who's in this notification group uh, can then start initiating the chat. Say, hey, did you really mean to make this call? Is this a missed dial? Are you OK? Do you need us to send somebody over? What's going on? Uh, and they can have that backwards and forth uh, chat. And also you have that that kind of that log of the 911 calls that were made. We have a couple other options where we can uh, uh, conference in uh, another phone number. Uh, so if uh, maybe we have a emergency response team uh, and we wanted uh, them to also be like a three way call. So the emergency uh, uh, team also uh, has a phone designated that rings and they pick it up and they know that it's uh, a 911 calls being made and they're going to help participate in that call or maybe they only want to listen in for whatever reason. Uh, those capabilities are also there as well. Uh, the phone number doesn't have to be a, uh, a user, so um, you can even have uh, an outside cell phone number, I believe, uh, listed as the uh, notification dial out number, though I haven't tested that. So we've got our uh, emergency calling policies and our emergency call routing policies. Uh, and we want to grant these. We want to basically assign these to individual sites. So we've got our uh, we've got our network site. So if you recall where we kind of set up our, our region and our site and our subnets, uh, we may we can then say, OK, anybody in the subnet is going to use this uh, call routing policy or this calling policy. So that's how we can uh, grant those different policies to the different locations. So maybe we say, all right, if you're calling from this location, we want to go out this session border controller. If you're calling from that location, we're going to go out that session border controller. And we can divide it up because we may have multiple session border controllers all over the world uh, connected and dialing into um, uh, dialing in and out of uh, teams. So we didn't need to be able to know how to route it based on the region, based on the site, really. Um, and we can set up all of our routes and, and build them out that way. And also we can have individual uh, notification groups. So uh, maybe reception in this office is notified of a 911 call, uh, but that office has a, a, maybe a nurse's office uh, or an emergency response team. And we can have, uh, if they're in that region we or that site, uh, we wanna have a different group uh, notified. So that's how we can break all that out and make sure that uh, the call is uh, notifying the right people and taking the correct route. Some fun little extra things. Uh, if you're in the US, 
uh, and you want to make an emergency call, you have to test this stuff, right? You always have to make sure that this solution is actually going to work. Uh, and that can be tricky because if you're in a city like Chicago, which has a pretty high crime rate, depending on where you are, uh, they don't want you just call 911 and go and, hey, I'm testing my phone system uh, because they actually have real emergencies to deal with. They don't they don't like that game uh, and you can be fined for that. So a lot of times you'd call the non-emergency number uh, in Washington, D.C. or Chicago or another big city and they'll say, all right, uh, you can place your one test call uh, Tuesday at uh, 437 in the morning uh and and you have to that's two weeks from now you know it's and it's it's a pain and if you got it wrong then you have to try all over again so uh the fun thing is if you're using calling plans if you dial 933 a bot will actually come back and tell you what location you're calling from uh so you can you can uh, without actually making a real 911 call uh, you can test the solution and, and figure it all out. If you have to test the solution before production, you can always just redirect 911 to a cell phone or something. It's a trick I've always used. Uh, and watch all that PIDF flow information hit your uh, gateway and make sure that the ELIN number matches with the location. Just make sure to put that back that uh, that the uh, emergency calls go to the emergency dispatch and not your cell phone as you walk out of that client and get an emergency call. Uh, of somebody panicking a month, panicking in a month. Uh, but if you are using direct routing, you're sending calls to the gateway. Uh, one of my clients actually uh, had this idea was they're looking into, um, they had a specific requirement where they're in a high rise skyscraper. Uh, and when the police arrive at the, uh, at, in the skyscraper lobby, they have to know what company to go to. They don't know which elevator to go to. Uh, you know, they they may need some help getting up to your floor. So they had a requirement uh, as part of their uh, rental agreement, uh, their their corporate lease in the skyscraper that they also had to notify when a 911 calls are made, had to also immediately notify uh, the building lobby. Uh, we looked into some gateways that kind of fulfilled this requirement uh, and they were incredibly uh, expensive. Uh, so their uh, their clever idea, and we helped put them this together, is they had a uh, they already had their session border controller set up, and they had their uh, sysloggers uh, already running for all kinds of uh, uh, security and other logging events, and they could base uh, triggers on these sysloggers. So they sent their session border controller uh, uh, logs over to their sysloger, and their sysloger they just configured to have a trigger it says when you see an invite uh, and the call is going to emergency services. Uh, we can parse that information that's being sent and trigger all kinds of uh, other things. We can trigger pop-ups, we can send it to a call log, and we can send emails right through PowerShell. They actually use a PowerShell script. They just emailed the building lobby. Um, they had, there's other things you can do, and you can trigger audible alerts. Anything you can you can trigger with a if this, then that type of solution uh, is really there. And I, I just thought it was clever, and I always like to, to bring it up and, and mention it in this. So I wanted to give a special shout out, uh, some some extra thanks to some of the people who I've uh, talked to when building this desk uh, deck. Uh, uh, Tom in the UK for kind of talking to me through uh, how the UK emergency calling works, and Ken in, up in Canada, uh, Greg in Australia, and Jens uh, just for being the Microsoft guy who knows his stuff inside and out and helps uh, is on that team. And Adam Ball, of course, I wanted to thank him because. Uh, I didn't realize that the uh, <laughs> ports and switches weren't live uh, until he pointed that one out. So I want to give a special thanks to them because uh, uh, every time I run this deck, I uh, learn a little bit more myself. So, and I also want to give a thanks to everybody. Uh, again, if you have any questions, uh, we can ask them. Uh, you can ask them in part of Teams if you're watching this uh, deck later, or if you're even watching it much, much later, or somehow you got hold of this deck a year from now, uh, I'm on Twitter. Just go ahead and ping me uh with any question you have because that's what i do i like to answer questions and talk and help um as i mentioned the uh, there is a uh, go to meeting breakout and chat so if you didn't want to use a q a function uh i'm just going to go hang out in that uh breakout and chat room for a little bit uh so if you see this and uh you want to get in there and ask some questions uh, we can pop in uh and i'll see if i can answer them and uh, maybe if i can't maybe somebody else in that uh, breakout can so and it looks like Anthony, you do have one question in the Q and A currently. All right. 
uh, yeah, the SIP provider would have to support PIDF low. Um, yeah, if you don't have the ELIN gateway that I was talking about, um, and you didn't want to have an ELIN gateway, then your SIP provider would have to, to support that. And like I said, the, the ones that do around here, uh, they want to charge you an arm and a leg for it, or they are, uh, it's, it's a specific trunk only for emergency calling. Now, the nice thing about using audio codes or ribbon, uh, are a couple of our sponsors here as your uh, ELIN gateway, uh, is then you don't have to worry about if your your SIP provider supports that. It could be a PRI line. You could be using uh, analog lines even. Uh, I have a school district uh, that has, uh, they're just in a very, very old area, uh, elementary school district, but they need to make sure that the 911 call gets to the right place. Uh, and they have an analog line in each building. So what we've got is we've got a little analog uh, gateway in every building connected to the little analog line in every building. Uh, and then the uh, so we send the call from teams to the uh, to our audio codes direct routing gateway and if it's a 911 call and we see the location we can say all right this location matches that ELIN number uh, so we're going to go send it over to uh, out that that uh, that analog gateway uh, to make sure that 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 call is made so it doesn't have to be they don't have to support PIDF low you can get as long as you get you license that 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 ELIN gateway uh, and you get it set up properly, you can you can be super old tech. It'll be you'll be just fine. All right, I think that's uh, all the questions I saw. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and pop into the uh, breakout and chat room. Uh, so if you want to come chat with me or or uh, whatever, I'll be uh, I'll be over there. And I'll go ahead and post that link for everyone. And close out the session. Thank you so much, Anthony. Thank you. Really appreciate you being here. Everybody have a wonderful day. Goodbye. Bye.